that's what bothers people so much. And here's what he said. It, this means the teaching of evolution, has huge consequences for society. I mean, it's where we come from. Does man have a purpose? Is there a purpose for our lives? Or are we just, you know, the result of chance? If we're the result of chance, if we're simply a mistake of nature, that puts a different moral demand on us. And then he thought for a second. He said, in fact, it doesn't put a moral demand on us than if, in fact, we are the creation of a being that has moral demands. Now, grammatically, so to me, as I thought about this, the key observation to me is, has been that the claim that evolution is a chance or random process is really at the heart of objections to what people refer to as Darwinism. And many people would say, well, well isn't evolution a chance, random process? And my answer, and the answer of just about every evolutionary biologist I know, would be no, evolution isn't random. And many people would say, well, wait a minute, I thought it was random. Let me try to answer it this way. The reality is that life is a material phenomenon. This is one of the few things, by the way, that Madonna got right. We do live in a material world. <laughs> and there is a mechanistic capacity for life that is built into the physics and chemistry of matter. And what that means is the process of evolution, which emerges out of this, is an inherent and a predictable property of nature. It's not a mistake. And what evolutionary processes do is they explore something that we biologists call adaptive space. And they explore it in a way that is predictable. And it is driven, evolution is driven by non-random natural selection. Natural selection is not random at all. And by natural law. Natural law is not random either. And both of these things are really the driving force behind evolution. So the reality is that what evolution does is to fill niches in nature. Certain types of life appear, and they appear almost inevitably. And I would argue, and other people have argued as well, that one of those evolutionary niches involves the emergence of sentient, self-aware organisms like us. And it, that emergence is directly driven by the physical constants of our universe. And I would say, therefore, in other words, the emergence of a world very much like the one in which we live isn't a random accident. It's not a mistake of nature. It is an outcome made possible and maybe even inevitable by the organization, by the fabric of nature itself. And we are creatures of the natural world. And what this means, in a sense, is that an evolutionary design to life is part of the inherent fabric of the natural world, not an exception, not a contradiction, not a mistake. So the capacity, my lesson is, the capacity for evolutionary change is built into nature. And as such, a person of faith can very easily understand evolution as part of God's providential plan. I want to let you know that I'm not the only person who thinks that way. And of course, you'll hear from John Haught. But I also want to point out a, a very interesting book by a very distinguished British paleontologist, Simon Conway Morris. The book is called Life's Solution. And you can get an idea of the bottom line from the title, Inevitable Humans in a Lonely Universe. Now, Simon doesn't really mean, and I wouldn't maintain, that the emergence of human beings, hairless bipedal primates who like NFL football and drinking beer and all that other sort of stuff, is inevitable. But I would argue, and he does, that the emergence of intelligent, self-aware, reflective organisms is something that evolution in a material world can be expected to produce. And that really is the point. Now, when I make that kind of argument, that evolution can be understood this way by people of faith, I often have people saying, well, how about Richard Dawkins? This is uh, Richard Dawkins, for those of you who don't know, and I can't imagine there's a single person in the room who doesn't know who Richard Dawkins is, is a writer and an evolutionary theorist at Oxford University in Great Britain. Um, he's, I think, one of the most brilliant writers on evolutionary theory alive today. I recommend his book, to Selfish Gene, The Selfish Gene, to all of my undergraduate students for a great exposition of modern evolutionary theory. But Richard is also a passionate anti-theist. And one of the things that he has said, and he must like this quote, because he wrote almost exactly this quote in two different books. So he really wanted to say this. The universe we observe about from science, from the Darwinian universe, has precisely the properties we should expect if there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, and no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. And every time I read that, I think, how does Richard manage to get up in the morning if that's what he thinks the <laughs> world is actually like? And, and I actually do know Richard. I consider him a friend. And I said, you know, the irony of this is that I don't know anybody who lives their life with more purpose than you do. 
and yet here is the statement about existence being purposeless. But nonetheless, many people would say he's a scientist, that's true, he's an evolutionary biologist and a great one, and therefore that is what evolution actually means. Well, you might say that, but there's other ways to think about it. Let's suppose for the sake of argument that we ask somebody else, somebody like John Hoot, who's here tonight and will speak for himself a little later, or Francis Collins, the retiring head of the, head of the Human Genome Project, probably on the short list for a Nobel Prize, one of the most distinguished evolutionary geneticists in the world, and also a deeply committed evangelical Christian, or Theodosius Dobzhansky, one of the great evolutionary geneticists of the 20th century. I'll show you a quote from Dobzhansky later, or my colleague Francisco Ayala, a National Academy of Science member and geneticist at UC Irvine. What might they say? Now, without putting words into each of their mouths, I would imagine that they would look at exactly the same universe that Dawkins does, exactly the same facts, and you know what? They might say something like this, and that is that the Darwinian universe that we observe has precisely the properties we might expect if there is, at bottom, the wisdom of a provident and purposeful God intent upon a fruitful and dynamic world and committed to a promise of freedom that makes genuine love possible. Now, is that a reasonable statement? You bet it is. Is that a scientific statement? Absolutely not. It's not a scientific statement because it's not testable. Ideas about purpose and meaning and value are not testable by the methods of science. But do you know what? Dawkins' statement wasn't scientific either. It was a philosophical interpretation on the basis of science. And it's important to understand that when a scientist speaks, it's not always science. And that is certainly true from the anti-theistic pronouncements of Richard Dawkins and many others. And I would argue that for all of us, the key question is whether science carries us as deeply into the mystery of life as we truly wish to go. Many people would say, yep, science is going to tell me everything I really want to know about the world. But I would also say that people of faith would argue that no, it doesn't. Now, this is not a rejection of science, but rather a recognition of the limitations of science that science cannot answer every question that is worth asking. And I think an understanding of the validity of this choice, to try to go deeper into your understanding of the world than science can actually do, is the first step that is necessary to make peace between science and religion, a peace which I think we all would agree is very much to be desired.